Oh, Mr. William Irwin. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the detail around the situation with vehicle testing is a matter for the Infrastructure Minister. I am aware that the Infrastructure Minister has commissioned an urgent external expert assessment of the steps needed to return NMOT centres to a position where full testing service can be delivered. And my department has provided support with the procurement of this external expertise. This work commenced on 3 February, and until such time as that assessment has been undertaken, it is not possible to determine the extent of any repair or replacement programme or associated costs. It is worth pointing out that DVA is a trading fund which allows it to hold reserves uh, to fund planned investment. So, in the first instance, any necessary expenditure can be funded from these DVA reserves, although this may have an impact on DVA's future capital uh, in new and refurbished test centres, and we will need to consider this in due course. William Merriman, supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response, and I think the Minister would accept that it is a very serious issue. Uh, and it is important that it is addressed as soon as possible. Yes, I, I concur with that. And I, I, mean, I have had a conversation with the Infrastructure Minister, and, and she clearly is waiting to see whether it is a replacement uh, programme we are into, which is a capital expenditure, or it is a repair programme we are into, which is a, a revenue expenditure. Uh, and certainly, I think uh, I will want to do all that I can to help her once she has come to the conclusions that she needs to come to. I call Dolores Kelly. Speaker, uh, Minister, um, can you uh, give us any information if there are any more unexpected spending pressures relating to unresolved issues from the three years of storm and hiatus? Well, there is no shortage of spending pressures, uh, as the member will well know, uh, and hence the reason why we are continuing to have discussions with Treasury in relation to the new decade and your approach document and the funding commitments within that to try and secure the necessary resources to meet uh, some of those pressures. So that dialogue will continue, uh, but I have been very clear of the very challenging uh, situation that faces us uh, in, in budgetary terms, uh, and uh, I'll be bringing a budget in, in the next number of weeks to the House, uh, and members will have an opportunity then to debate that in full. I call Roy Beggs. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister also uh, be reviewing the contracts, given the legal aspect involved, uh, and that those who were responsible for maintaining the equipment? failed to spot the, these flaws in the MOT centres and which has caused such disruption? Well, I think that will be a matter for the, the Department for Infrastructure to review uh, uh, with their contracts. Uh, what, what we want to do is, is firstly assist them in providing some expertise to do the analysis. Uh, and Once that analysis is done, as I say, it, it depends whether it takes us into a programme of replacement or repair. Then, uh, obviously, there will be a question of the finance to do that. Some of that the DVA should have themselves. Uh, and others uh, may come to us, but I mean, I think everybody has agreed that we want to get the situation. However, it is resolved. Whatever the future implications for for contracts in, in uh, MOT centres, that we want to ensure that we get the system back up and working again as quickly as we can. I call Trevor Lunn. I want this very similar to the last question. Unfortunately, I wanted to ask the minister about the question of liability for this. Uh, after I called the fiasco. The, uh, it, it seems astonishing that all these lifts should have failed at the same time. So I wonder what about the inspection regime, how old they were, who supplied them, and is there any possibility of recovering money so that it won't cost the public purse a fortune? Well, as I said in my initial answer, the, the Minister for Infrastructure has instigated two separate investigations, uh, and I would hope that some of the questions that he and the previous member have asked will then be answered in those investigations as to how we got to this situation, and then what what's the consequences for going forward in terms of contract and who would be liable, uh, and whether there's any uh, ability to claw back uh, and make people answerable for, for the service that they ought to have provided. I call Jerry Carl. I'm not sure if the minister is aware that the infrastructure minister uh, said um, this morning in a written uh, answer to a question raised by myself that there are no plans uh, to bring outsourced maintenance of DVA equipment in house. Does the minister share the view of his executive colleague? Well, I wasn't aware uh, of uh, what our plans were in relation to it, so I'm, I'm obviously not across a written answer that was given to you this morning. Uh, but as I said, I almost feel like my old job, which was DRD Minister here, I'm up answering questions for infrastructure. Uh, and, and clearly it's a matter that she's going to have to deal with. And I presume that when she does have the uh, result of both the investigations that she has set out, she'll be bringing those, I presume, to the Assembly, to the Committee and to the Executive, and then we'll take decisions in relation to them. 
Moving on to the next question, and I call Andrew Muir. Cancorda, frequent, frequent revaluations are in line with policy directions already set by the last two finance ministers. Also, business organisations have long called for frequent and regular revaluations. At the last revaluation in 2015, transitional relief was not considered necessary, even after the period of 12 years, so it would be difficult to justify that now after just five years. The transitional relief scheme that operates in Britain delays the decreased liability for those whose bills go down, as well as the increased liability for those whose bills go up. Any scheme which only worked in one way, suppressing any increases, would be very difficult to justify financially, not least alongside the very many other competing priorities facing the Executive. I have therefore no plans to implement a transitional relief scheme for 2021. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware of the impact of REVAL 2020, particularly upon, for example, the hospitality sector. And it's just to ask the Minister to outline what other measures he's considering to assist these businesses, because the rises that have been affected to some uh, organisations potentially could result in closure. And I think it's important maybe the Minister outlines what measures are being considered to assist the businesses affected by this. Well, I'm aware that uh, any REVAL will throw up. Uh, people who, who are satisfied, and I think there's some 75% uh, of retail properties will see no change or a decrease in valuation. But obviously, those who see an increase uh, have an opportunity, particularly those in the hospitality sector, have an opportunity to challenge, uh, to appeal to LPS. There is also a factor, in, particularly in relation to the hospitality sector, where there is a need for information sharing uh, with LPS, particularly in relation to turnover. Uh, and I would appeal to people in the hospitality sector to do that as quickly as they can, because that does allow a more accurate assessment of their rates liability. So there are small business rate relief schemes generally uh, for businesses, uh, but I understand that businesses are struggling, the economic circumstances aren't good, and that's why there was a very significant consultation undertaken over the course of last autumn. The results of that are being analysed by myself and the department, and we will make decisions and bring those to the executive uh, in the coming time. I call Paul Fruit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, it is correct that we should do revaluations more uh, often to allow businesses to be able to uh, change uh, in a smaller way. But given the fact that some in my constituency, Minister, could well see rates increases of 600%, is, is it too soon to roll out a transitional relief scheme? And would that not be used, or could not not, not be used? in order to remove the shock trauma that businesses will face if they, are, if they experience increases like that? Well, again, I am not aware of the, the specifics that the uh, member mentions, but I would say that there, there, there are significantly more people or more businesses that have either no change or a reduction than there are who have an increase. Now, if there are people who have a very substantial increase, then I think they should be engaged with LPS. In relation to that, if it's particularly people in the hospitality sector, then there are methodologies uh, agreed to use evidence of receipts and expenditure in order to come to a fair assessment uh, of rental value, and that's the rental value that's then used for the rates bill. So I would appeal to people who are suffering, as you have outlaid, to engage with LPS. We, we have conducted a review uh, and a consultation. It was a very extensive one. It was very well uh, responded to, and so that has given us much information uh, to allow us to make an assessment going forward. But for those who particularly are, are suffering with what they consider to be very substantial increases, then they need to engage with LPS to try and see how that can be worked through. Thank you, Pat Catney. Uh, Minister, uh, just talking on the hospitality trade, and that trade can be very fatal, so it can. And those that find themselves invested in their premises will find themselves much levied upon. And to agree with the member, uh, uh, Mr. Frew, across the table there, when he said that there are increases within that sector, there must be a fair methodology in order to look at these rates, Minister. And I, for one, am not sure that the rating system at the moment. Uh, is fit for purpose, and I hope you would agree with me and look at ways in order to change that and make it more fair. Well, there are standard methodologies for assessing rental values for properties. Uh, uh, there are different valuations for, for uh, some in the hospitality sector, and, and they, as I say, can use evidence of receipts and expenditure in order to come to a more fair assessment. So I would encourage there has been a, a fairly low uptake in terms of providing that type of information to LPS. And so I would encourage those who are facing particular pressures, and I understand uh, people in the hospitality sector do have good times and bad times, and 
quiet periods of the year, and like all businesses are struggling. Uh, so I would encourage them to, to engage with the full information required in order that they get the first possible assessment of what their rate liability is. I call Meg Nesbitt. Uh, uh, given the draft programme for government uh, targets the promotion of longer, healthier, more active lives, uh, and notwithstanding rates reliefs within the sports sector, uh, how do you square that to NAV increases of 30 to 40 per cent? Belfast Indoor Bowls up 30.35. Banbridge Rugby, 42.16 per cent, and perhaps close to the Minister's own heart, the Athletics Grounds in Armagh, 21.75 per cent increase in NAV. Well, I think and, uh, I, I understand entirely. Uh, as a visitor to the Athletic Grounds, uh, I get asked about these matters. Uh, but properties such as sports clubs are rarely rented, so an indirect approach has to be found of establishing rental value. Uh, I would have to say that in, there is a substantial sports uh, rates relief uh, programme which, which is any of the facility which is used for sporting part only, any of the overall facility uh, can get up to 80 per cent uh, relief, which means they are only paying 20 per cent of the rates bill. Obviously then if you get into social club aspects, part of that are other aspects which have a more commercial uh, uh, outlook in terms of the, how they are used. Uh, then they are subject to full, uh, full rates. So I, I, I do get that. Uh, we obviously are wanting to encourage uh, more people to be active, but where people are using premises or facilities purely for sports, then they are entitled to very substantial rates relief. I call Ms Liz Kimmins. Corla, and I just want to take this opportunity to formally congratulate uh, the Minister on his appointment. Very proud to call him my colleague, and I know he'll do a formidable job. Uh, case a tree. Uh, I thank the member for her kind words. Uh, the public consultation closed towards mid-November with very valuable feedback from the public in the meetings and the 239 written responses received. My department are in the process of briefing me fully on the business rates review and I want to establish what is available to us as an executive in terms of short and medium term policy objectives in the context of the overall budget. Supplementary Liz Kimmins. Thank the Minister for his response. And I know there is an urgent need for reform um, for the rating system, particularly for businesses, and it is really felt in my own constituency in Uri and Armagh. Um, can I ask the Minister, will he also be reviewing domestic rates? The, the, uh, obviously, the question of the domestic rates is going to be part of the budget programme uh, and the budget legislation that we bring forward uh, to the uh, executive, because all of these things are going to have to be considered in the round in terms of what the executive's requirements are. Uh, rates is one of the very few uh, financial levers we have in order to, to uh, bring in money to provide for services which are very much under pressure across health and education and a range of services. So all of that will be in the mix, uh, and we'll be taking some uh, propositions uh, to the executive for decisions, which will then be reflected in the budget uh, legislation that's brought to the assembly. I call Sinead Bradley. Mr. Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister, has he given any consideration to adopting a rate relief system for the independent retailers, such as that that exists in England? Well, we will consider all options, uh, because, as I said, there has been a very substantial consultation. There was a particular interest in the Back to Business scheme, uh, which does provide uh, it, it provides new and emerging business support, and, and, and there was a lot of support expressed for a scheme such as that to be reinstated. And that's something that I'm going to look at. But I, the, the consultation, as I say, was quite extensive. Uh, quite a lot of issues thrown up during it. Uh, I have one tend to try and study that because we have to try. The objective of this is to try and bring the fairest possible uh, rates proposition, which the assembly and the executive can then agree, uh, and to ensure that in doing so we, we try and keep businesses viable and keep. Uh, town centres uh, economically active. So uh, I'm happy to look at any schemes that may contribute to that, but I know that the back in business one was one which received particular attention during the, the consultation. I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, to determine the net annual value of business properties, it requires the Land and Property Service to gather data from the various businesses. Is the Minister content with the, the recent gathering of data which will determine uh, the most up-to-date valuation list? Because indeed, if this was to be able to be improved, it may reduce the number of appeals that businesses um, are, are expected to bring forward. 
Well, as I say, there is a, there is a standard methodology used for assessing businesses. There are, are, are other methodologies used for the hospitality sector. And that. If, if people are not satisfied with that, then by all means they should contact LPS and challenge if, if they feel that the increase that, uh, from the revaluation exercise has been too much. I remember previously being on the Finance Committee, and we were very critical of the Department that it had taken 13 years to do a revaluation exercise, and that meant that uh, rate, rateable values then shot up through the roof and, and people got hit with a very substantial raise. So that there is an attempt to do them over a more frequent period, and that's over five years, to make sure that they don't have that type of increase. But if, if, if businesses or properties are fighting that, then I think by all means they should, they should engage with LPS and try and get a reassessment of what they've been uh, assessed for. Call, call given. Uh, reviewing the non-domestic rating system, um, could the Minister also outline how uh, he engages with local government uh, and in particular uh, the issue around Causeway Coast and Glens to do with their setting of the rate? Or it may be a question that's more for the Communities Minister, but nevertheless, given the, the seriousness of the issue, if the Minister is able to comment. Well, I, I wouldn't want to comment on individual Council's uh, issues, but I would say that you know, if we, we can undertake all of this exercise and try and find the fairest rating system, if local government then go off, uh, and sometimes if we manage to keep rates down and local government decide to fill the gap by putting theirs up, then it really undoes uh, what work is done in this institution. So I think there needs to be a greater degree of cooperation across all the councils with uh, this institution to try and make sure that whatever, uh, of course, local government can set their own rate, that's their, that's their, uh, that's their remit. Uh, but I do think that we, if we have a collective approach to try and support the economy, to try and support town centres, to try and get the fairest possible uh, rating system on both domestic and non-domestic, then I think we do need a significant degree of collaboration and cooperation from local government as well. And uh, I've spoken to my own officials about this, and it's something that we will be uh, trying to engage with local government in the time ahead to make sure that whatever uh, decisions we come to in relation to rates, that, that you know, local government's approach then doesn't upend that one way or the other. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I, can I ask the Minister whether consideration can be given to valuations occurring perhaps uh, more regularly than every five years, and if more advanced notice of those uh, valuations can be given also? Well, the, the evaluation, this, this one has taken place in five years. As I said previously, when I was uh, a member of, of the Finance Committee a number of years back, the criticism was that it was 13 years since the revaluation, and so there was a determined effort. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say from the Department and from LPS to get valuations on a more fr frequent basis. So I think five years is, uh, you know, anything more than that would be too long. Uh, so I hope that this sets a standard, pardon me, that the Department and LPS hold to in terms of, of revaluation, because anything longer than that I think leads to very significant increases, which can be very challenging for businesses. Nicole, Mr. Melissa McHugh. The uh, 760 million of the original 1 billion confidence supply funding has been allocated to departments between 2017, 18, and 2019, 20. This includes 400 million on infrastructure investment, 200 million on health transformation, 100 million on health and education pressures, 40 million on tackling severe deprivation, and 20 million on mental health. The Secretary of State told the parties that the remaining £240 million of this ring fence funding has now been withdrawn. Discussions with the Treasury on the financial package are ongoing. In particular, I am attempting to restore the confidence and supply funding. Lisa McHugh, supplementary. Mr. Margaret, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that our Minister is in pursuit of uh, these additional funds which are uh, required here uh, uh, in order to meet many of our objectives. Uh, and given that um, the British Chancellor will deliver his budget on the 11th uh, of March, when does the Minister intend to bring forward the Executive's budget? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get to ask that question. I, I, uh, when do you intend to bring forward the Executive's budget to the Assembly, given that uh, the British Chancellor's their budget on the 11th of March? Sorry, apologies to the member. Yes, that, that does place in a bit of a, a challenge because if, as is promised, the, uh, the, the, as, as it seems to be promised by the British Prime Minister, that the budget is going to involve a significant degree of spending, and that will have, a, if you like, a trickle-down impact on our budget. Uh, if we, in order to satisfy rates bills, going to need an early budget in March, and that might then miss that date 
uh, and we may then have substantial funds to reallocate. I hope we have substantial funds to reallocate as a consequence of the budget in Westminster. But we're not certain of that. Uh, so the question will be, do we go before that or go after that? And that's something I'm currently discussing with officials, uh, because we do not want then to run late with that and subsequently have, have rates bill going out late to premises who, who bank on, on spending the money incrementally over, over the year. Uh, in terms of their rates liability. So it is a bit of a dilemma that the budget in Britain is on the 11th of March. It's really in the middle of the timescale where we would be doing our work, but we obviously want to try and get some understanding of what might flow from that in terms of finances for this institution. I call Mr Jim Allister. Is there not a more fundamental question of confidence for the Minister, given his cruel treatment of the Quinn family, that he should be reflecting upon? But could I ask him, in respect of the confidence and supply money, if the offer has been withdrawn, is there any indication that that money is ever going to come to whoever the Minister of Finance might be? Because if Minister Murphy had a shred of integrity, he would have resigned over the Quinn issue. Okay. Well, firstly, in relation to the uh, question, of course, we want to. Uh, there was a certain understanding between those who negotiated confidence supply money and those who were providing it that it was ring fenced, and even if the uh, profile had to be extended uh, into later years, that that money was ring fenced. The Secretary of State told us verbally we have no written communication uh, that such uh, money was no longer on the table. Uh, and so we have been engaging with Treasury to try and secure that money and to secure the monies that uh, are committed to uh, in the promises in the new decade new approach document. Uh, I won't take any lectures from the member who uh, refused to discipline his own party member, Trevor Collins, who was campaigning for the UDA killer Tarns night, who caused, uh, carried out a massacre in Grey Steel. Uh, you know, the, member, the member who sat, who sat alongside loyalist paramilitaries on the the member who sat alongside paramilitaries on the, uh, the Loyalist Band uh, uh, marching Resume, forum. But the Minister resume uh, his seat for just a one second. You just remind Mr. Allister that you have to listen to the Speaker when the Speaker calls order in the House. I expect, as I respect all members, all members must respect the order and the ruling of the Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Concord. I'm just pointing out some of the uh, discrepancies in the, own, in the member's own approach in relation to issues, which makes him just uh, another unionist with double standards, in other words, a hypocrite. I call, I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, um, uh, I was interested to hear the Minister refer to discussions he's had about the UK budget on the 10th of March. Can he give us an update on discussions he's had around the creation of two bodies? One, the Fiscal Council that's mentioned in the new document, new decade, new approach document, which um, will hopefully address some of the inconsistencies he talked about about the Treasury approach, and then second, the fiscal commission that he um, has expressed a desire to be set up, the independent Smith Commission-style body. Can you give us an update on those two things? Well, the member is quite right in that the fiscal council was mentioned. I think first mentioned in the Stormont House Agreement, uh, and is yet to be uh, set up. It is a, a, a function that is a, is very regular in, in, in democracies, particularly in the, in the Western world, to assist uh, with an executive in terms of spending plans and looking at, looking at issues that would face in the longer term. So it's, it can be a very useful body. Clearly, what we want to do is uh, there is not much by way of detail or description in the document or even in the reference in the most latest agreement to it. So what we want to do is flesh that out a little bit, bring forward some ideas from it, a remit, uh, the type of personnel that would be on it uh, and the type of function it would provide for the executive and put that to executive colleagues and I hope to be uh, doing that in the near future. In relation to the Fiscal Commission, he's correct, I have signalled my desire. Uh, I think uh, as, as the discussion around the rates issue shows, we have very limited fiscal levers. Uh, I think in order to support our own programme for government priorities, it would be useful for an executive to have a greater range of fiscal levers at its disposal. Uh, and I'm very happy to, uh, to do some work, as I've indicated to colleagues, in relation to uh, a commission. Uh, again, it has to be fleshed out in terms of its remit and the personnel involved in it. But I would like to see such a commission go out uh, to the community to consult, obviously, with members in this body, but to also consult right across the community uh, in relation to what uh, tax varying or, or levers uh, we may have uh, be able to, to secure at our disposal. It, it, 
it's an exercise which is, he's correct has already been done in Scotland, has been done in Wales. Uh, I don't see any reason why we would not try and access some uh, financial levers in order to allow us uh, to support our own programme for government and, de and, and determine our own priorities and try and fund them accordingly. I call Paula Bradshaw. It was, it was to, to um, look at what, to, sorry, to ask the minister what would Plan B be if he is unsuccessful in securing that uh, the remainder of the confidence and supply money in terms of York Street inter interchange. Thank you. Well, I think the actual, the, it, I mean, this was this was a report given verbally at a meeting. Uh, I, I wasn't involved in negotiating confidence supply or how it would be spent, uh, but my, my understanding was that the, the money that appears to be shortened was more to do with broadband contract uh, rather than the York Street interchange. Uh, but, uh, and it's one factor of the money that we want to try and secure, but the bigger factor is the money that was committed to as part of the commitments, the financial commitments in the, in the new decade year approach document. Those were substantial commitments which were worked through with all of the parties, working with senior civil servants, with the, the head of the civil service, the permanent secretary of the Department of Finance, and senior civil service from the NIO. So it wasn't simply a wish list that people dreamed up and, and presented. This was a carefully worked through document. There are significant commitments in those that I think need to be met. If they aren't met, I think we're into a, a very difficult situation over the next number of years in terms of trying to uh, deliver on our own priorities. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Question five. Financial transactions capital can only be used for loans to or equity investment in the private sector. It cannot be used to fund de departmental pressures. The position in 2019-20 was exacerbated by the inability to use FTC for co-ownership housing as planned. This was due to the delay in taking legislation through Westminster to address the classification issue. The Communities Minister has indicated her intention to resolve this matter for 2021. Uh, I am keen to ensure a significant uptake in the use of financial transactions capital and a range of actions are currently underway. My officials have been engaging with, the other treasury, uh, with other treasury and other devolved administrations on how this funding is to be used in other regions. In addition, the, the department officials are liaising with the Strategic Investment Board to examine the issues leading to a lack of uptake. I have also asked to engage with other departments to explore innovative ways in which this funding can be used, and I will bring the result of this work back to the executive in due course. Claire Bailey, supplementary. Thank you very much um, for your answer, Minister. And I'm glad to hear you mention the co-ownership um, scheme in particular, but given the level of need, particularly for all social housing providers and within our urban regeneration, does the Minister feel that the Northern Ireland Investment Fund, Fund has proved beneficial for relieving any pressures in those sectors? Well, I'm certain that the, uh, the, the Communities Minister here beside me will be looking at all uh, funding opportunities and, and uh, to, to try and ensure the priority is uh, to try and uh, provide housing uh, for, uh, for, for hard pressed people and families who are seeking to get proper homes. Uh, and so we, I, I think that's a commitment that the executive wants to support as well. So, however, we can uh, secure that money. Obviously, uh, as I said in, in response to an earlier question, you know, the, the, the commitments that were given under the, the new decade new approach document are ones that I feel need to be fulfilled, uh, because that will provide us with a significant amount of capital over the next 10 years, which will allow us to uh, engage in some of those programmes. But uh, I'm certain that the Executive, and particularly the Communities Minister, will be looking at any and, any and all resources that may become available to try and press forward with that programme. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We'll now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call on Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I realise the Minister has asked a number of questions, answered a number of questions relating to rates, but does the Minister accept that there is concern at the lack of consistency in the revaluation process? And for some, uh, it means a massive hike in the rates. And does the Minister accept that? I, I, I think it certainly does, and that's the evidence that. Uh, 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 certainly members and myself. I mean, I'm an elected representative in the constituency, the same as himself, and, and he'll, like me, be talking to business people and uh, business owners uh, about uh, some of the issues they have with that. So I, I think that, uh, as I said, there are different methodologies of calculating uh, this. There has been a very substantial consultation with the business community over the course of the autumn. Uh, out of that, there have flowed some suggestions, and I want to look at those very carefully, because the objective in all of this is to get the fairest possible rating system for people uh, and to ensure that businesses remain viable and, and that nothing that the executive does 
uh, puts a, a challenge to, to them in, in, in trying to do that. However, we, the, the, the revenue from rates is hugely important in terms of provision of health and education and other public services. So that's the balance that we have to strike in relation to that. But if there are particular instances where people feel uh, that the valuation has been substantially too high, then they need to engage with LPS. If it's in the hospitality sector, they need to provide some evidence in terms of their, uh, their turnover. Uh, but in other sectors, they, they need to engage and see can they get a, a change of approach to that. Mr. Darwin, supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response, but does the Minister accept that in some cases the rates uh, are, have become intolerable for some of these businesses? I had one particular business who had a rate bill in a small town in Iron Uri and Amma constituency, and his rates was 36,000, and they're increased in the new proposal to 50,000 per year. Well, I have to say that does seem very substantial, uh, and I, I but obviously need to know the detail of the individual uh, business involved to try and make uh, further comment on. But uh, what I would say is, where people do feel uh, that the increase has been something which is unwarranted, then they should engage uh, with the LPS. Uh, they should provide whatever information they can uh, to challenge that. Uh, I, I would be encouraging LPS to, to engage with all businesses to make sure that people have the. the uh, have, have an attempt to state their case uh, and make that case to LPS and try and get the fairest possible uh, rating li uh, of liability assessment for themselves. I call Justin McNulty. Given there is a strong possibility the Minister's party will be in government in the South, can the Minister outline his plans to engage with the Irish Government on the financial commitments made in the new decade? Your approach agreement. Well, I had uh, I'd been in the process of seeking a meeting with the finance minister in uh, Dublin, Pascal Donoghue, when the election was called, and so it wasn't possible to do that meeting. It, it came very quickly after our own institutions were reformed. So clearly, there is a need. I have to say that the commitments that were given uh, from uh, the government in Dublin, as part of that, were outlined very clearly to us in financial terms as to what the amounts were, whereas that wasn't the case from the. British government side. Uh, and so I, I do expect, and I have had, had conversations with both Taoiseach and Tanister uh, since that, uh, that they will live up to those commitments. Uh, but I think there are other areas that I think obviously we need to explore, uh, both in terms of perhaps European funding, uh, funding that may have flowed from uh, Brexit preparations. Uh, and so the earliest possible meeting with the new finance minister in Dublin will be uh, something that I intend to pursue very quickly. Supplementary, Justin McNulty. Are there any other All Ireland priorities the Minister will be pursuing? Well, a bit like himself, the All Ireland priority will be pursuing is Armagh <laughs> <laughs> for the title. Uh, but aside from that uh, pressing issue, of course, uh, there are a, a range of issues. Uh, and I think the earlier the meeting we can get of the North South Ministerial Council to pick things up where they left off uh, over, over the years uh, is very important. Uh, there are, uh, as I say, a number of issues that challenges have flow to all parts of the island from the Brexit and the protocols that have been worked out and the, the arrangements that need to be made as a consequence of that. But there are also significant areas. I mean, there is mention of a border fund uh, in the document. I think it's something that I want to explore further with the uh, finance minister in Dublin and also with the Treasury, uh, because border communities are, the, are, are, are those who, will, so, who have suffered most from peripherality from both states. But they will continue to suffer, I think, as a consequence of Brexit, regardless of how it plays out. Uh, and so, we uh, want to have those discussions. I think the North South Ministerial Council is the, is the best vehicle for that, and I look forward to its earliest possible uh, reinstatement. Of course, we have to get a government elected in Dublin, uh, and who knows what the makeup of that government may be. Uh, but the sooner it, it, we have a government in place, the better. And I think this executive can get down to business with it. I call Mr. Sean Lynch. Sure, my, I'll get, uh, can, call you. can I ask the Minister for an update on his plans to reform procurement? Sure, my, well, I think that we, uh, some pe people don't often recognise that the executive, small and all as we are this place, uh, we're a very substantial spender of public funds. Uh, and we have an opportunity, to, in, in my view, to ensure, firstly, that those, those funds are spent in an ethical way, uh, in a way which promotes uh, equality but also that they are spent in a way which supports the programme for government commitments that the executive have uh, and those priorities. So I think we need to ensure uh, that we have a, a very strong 
hold on a procurement policy. I intend to review procurement policy. I also will consider into the future a social value act uh, to make sure that we get the best benefit for society out of the public money, which is, after all, society's money that we are in charge of spending in this institution. I want to see procurement done in a way which is ethical and which promotes the values of this institution and promotes the objectives of the programme for government. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for his uh, answer. The social enterprise sector is of the strong view if social value is to be properly accounted for, it has to be part of scoring criteria for um, tenders. Does the Minister intend to consider this issue as part of his pre consultation? Yeah, and, uh, we do, and we're engaging with the, uh, the uh, uh, social sector as well. Uh, there has been an ongoing engagement with them. Some of the issues that they have raised, I think, can be changed as a matter of policy. Uh, but certainly, the Social Value Act is, has been uh, one issue that has been put forward and is under consideration. Uh, and of course, if I intend to bring forward some proposals, that I will be bringing it to the executive, and obviously discussing it with the finance committee as well. Uh, but I think we do, at a time when we have a very restricted uh, budget, a very restricted public finances, we need to make sure that we spend them in the best way possible. That not only promotes the, the greatest benefit for society here, but also uh, promotes the objectives of the programme for government. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be fully aware of the disquiet and public concern, and the concern by many in this Assembly that feel towards uh, the Minister with the inability to give an adequate public apology to the family of Paul Quinn. Would he now like to take this opportunity in this Assembly to unequivo here, here. unequivocally state that he accepts that Paul Quinn was not a criminal and, he will not, and that he will give a full account of the incident as he knows it and information to PSNI and, and Garda Shikona? Here, here. Well, can, uh, first of I made a statement last week and I have written to that family. I would caution the member in saying I give a full account of the incident as I know it, because that's a presumption that I have knowledge in relation to that incident, and I would just caution him in, 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 in relation to his language uh, and also the, the committee that wrote to me in the same terms. Uh, it's a very dangerous presumption to make, both for me personally, but also for those who make it in terms of their, their own uh, legal uh, future. Mr Butler, Sublime Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No presumption, Minister. Um, has the Minister considered his position at any point in this last uh, few weeks in line with the seven principles for public service and the ministerial code of conduct? Here, here. Well, I say no. And can I say uh, that the incident he refers to is some 13 years old? Not two weeks ago, here, your party leader welcomed me, welcomed my appointment as Minister, uh, pledged himself to work with me in good faith. Uh, and so uh, I find it uh, this belated uh, uh, adherence to the, the, the issue that you have now raised. Uh, I have known uh, people in your own party, your party leader, for four years. I have been chair. Uh, it was, the issue was never raised with me once. I have been chair of the Economy Committee. He was my deputy chair. Never raised the issue once. I met the chair and the deputy chair of the Finance Committee a number of weeks ago. They never raised this issue with me. They wished me well. They just wanted to support me in my role as minister. Uh, and yet, in this last week, uh, apparently that they have some serious considerations about my fitness for being a minister. So you will understand I feel somewhat sceptical uh, about their related interest in this issue, but certainly I have, as I said in your previous answer, I have written to the family, I have made a statement last week, and that is where the matter rests with me. I thank the Minister for his responses up until now. I could I ask the Minister whether his departmental officials will work with the Department for the Economy to publish detailed assessments in relation to the economic and fiscal impacts on Northern Ireland of the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act, including an impact if the UK does not conclude a new trade deal with the EU by December of this year? Yeah, I thank the member for his question. As he knows, the executive has established a Brexit subcommittee. Uh, and one of the first things we ascertained last week is that the consequences of a no deal, even though they are less serious now than perhaps they were prior to this agreement, but the consequences of a no deal are still on the table uh, for us. So that option uh, still has to be planned for. Uh, and so we will continue to assess not only the, the loss of funding from the European Union across the various programmes that we will lose, but also the cost in terms of the implementation of the protocols here. Uh, and that's something we want to engage with Treasury. I had a discussion 
uh, last week with both the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers in relation to that because there are implications in terms of loss of funding for both Scotland and Wales. But we uniquely here have the additional costs in terms of implementations of the protocols and the impact, uh, the negative impact that some of the protocols may have uh, on our economy here. Uh, and so those are additional uh, questions that will arise. But I expect that the subcommittee, which only met for the first time last week and is meeting again tomorrow, uh, we will work through these issues, we will work with the other institutions, we will work with Dublin and we will work with Brussels uh, and engage with Treasury to try and ensure that we, don't, uh, or we suffer as least as possible from the consequence of this, because I think, as he would recognise as I do, there is no good outcome to Brexit for anybody in this island. Supplementary, Patrick McGlone. Okay, Gerda Mayer, good uh, I, uh, Thanks very much, Minister. Uh, could the Minister, maybe you have had, uh, as you outlined there very kindly, the connections that you have had with other ministers in other regions around this particular issue. Could you advise me, please, if there is any mechanism has been established whereby there can be progress updates on the, the, how the withdrawal agreement is moving along those negotiations with the EU, and if indeed there might be a trade deal before the end of this year, what is the mechanism for that, if there has been one established with the various regions? There is certainly in relation to the devolved institutions, there is that the joint ministerial meeting. I think there was one happened two weeks ago in Cardiff with the first and deputy first minister we were at. Uh, that I think was the first experience from a ministerial point of view of this institution. I know that certainly uh, the Scottish institution has complained long and loud uh, about a lack of information uh, coming to that. So obviously our own first and deputy first minister will have to test that and see if we're getting satisfactory information and updates as to how the negotiations are going along. We, of course, can engage uh, at any stage with Brussels, as I would intend to do, and I'm sure other executive ministers will intend to do, and we can engage with Dublin uh, to get a sense of how negotiations are going as well. So we, we don't only have, uh, have one uh, fighter in the game, if you know what I mean, in, in relation to this, that we, we have other sources of information. But I think it's important for this executive and for this assembly to have access to all of the information we can possibly get, because, as we have said, the impact on this island is worse than anywhere else. The consequences for us are worse than anywhere else, and we need to secure all the information necessary to try and offset as best we can uh, the consequences of the flow from Brexit. I call Mr. Pod Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, uh, Minister, uh, I'm on that Finance Committee, and like your colleague that's gone before, I want to do whatever I possibly can to try and help Francie Brawley, and that was what I took out of that this morning. But, Minister, would you agree that there is a genuine fear, especially among the hospitality trade, of simply of what's coming down the road? And yes, I do hear you saying that you want to engage with that sector, but I'm going to ask the Minister, would he engage with them or with the retail sector themselves? And I would be quite happy in order to go along with them to meet with the Minister. Well, I have, uh, as I say, I am very aware. I'm not simply just a minister. I'm also a constituency representative uh, who, who engages with businesses in my own constituency on a very frequent basis. So I am very aware of some of the issues that have been raised. There was to be a rates roundtable planned for tomorrow. The executive, or not tomorrow, sorry, on Wednesday. The executive uh, have uh, arranged a, a, an away day session, so that kind of superseded all that. But it very, I, I, I'm almost certain there's a date rescheduled for that, which we will get all of the sectors in and have a full discussion in relation to the impacts uh, of the incoming rates policy. The, 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 uh, we have not set the rate as yet, so we want to make sure that we hear fully and uh, with all of the information from all of the sectors on how it is impacting uh, on them uh, to enable us to take the most fair decision. As I have said on a number of occasions, the objective of this is to get the fairest rate possible so we can support people in business and try and grow the economy and try and meet some of the programme for government targets of the executive.